and uh, speak to you on a subject which um, at one time was, was somewhat important to me, and I think it's still important to have an understanding of this topic. Let me just uh, see if we can start right here. Uh, and the subject of my talk tonight is Whispering Breath, the History, Chemistry, and Biology of Chemical Warfare Agents. So I see chemists here and biologists here. We're just miss, missing the historians, and, and then we have a full set. Uh, I wanted to just mention uh, the uh, picture up on the title page of the slide. This is a very iconic picture from World War II. Uh, and what you're seeing on the picture are a group of British soldiers who had been blinded by uh, the use of mustard gas in uh, 1918. And uh, they're walking to the aid station. There'd be one person at the front of the line who could, who could see, and they were following him. Apparently, there were reports that there would be lines as long as 200 men sort of snaking their way to the aid station after they'd been exposed to uh, chemical warfare agents. I'm um, oftentimes asked, um, how did I get interested in uh, chemical warfare agents? And I always say, I opened up the newspaper uh, one time and went to the funny pages and there was a great cartoon from the Ki Kingdom of Id that uh, got me interested. But actually, um, I became interested in chemical warfare agents back in 1976 when uh, I was a recently graduated uh, BS in chemistry with a nice shiny uh, BS degree in my hand. And I also had uh, shiny brass bars on my shoulders. I was an ROTC uh, officer candidate. And uh, I was. Uh, uh, inducted into the chemical corps of the United States Army. And so uh, I spent about a year active service, and during that year I went to a number of training schools, Ed Edge uh, Wood Arsenal in Maryland, and I also spent about three or four months uh, working on uh, what's called a binary nerve agent. And I was, as a second lieutenant, uh, I was a deputy officer on a, a project, deputy project officer. And, you know, that was a lot of responsibility for someone 21 years old who had just graduated from college. Uh, we're going to start off with some definitions. And uh, we'll first define what exactly is chemical warfare. And I want to differentiate it a little bit from biological warfare. And, uh, the Army lumps uh, chemical and biological warfare together. It's uh, abbreviated CBW. Uh, what exactly is chemical warfare? It's the use of uh, chemical substances, which are toxic or poisons. And these uh, chemical substances are designed to kill, injure, or incapacitate. Okay. Now, chemical warfare has a considerable history. Uh, essentially within the last 100 years. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about that history. Uh, one of the things we uh, are afraid of is that because of the relative access to chemical weapons, they could become a significant terror weapon. Okay? And they actually have been used in uh, terrorist attacks. And if we have time, I might get to that. Uh, the other area of CBW was biological warfare. Uh, biological warfare, you use live agents, usually either bacteria, uh, for example, uh, uh, Bacillus uh, anth anthracis, which is the anthrax uh, bacteria, or viruses, uh, the very oli is the virus for, uh, uh, well, it's popped out of my head. Um, but uh, it, it's, these are live agents. And so, uh, with biological warfare, you can uh, be exposed to the actual agent from the weaponized source, or you can pass along diseases by contagion. Okay? Uh, biological warfare has not been used significantly, uh, but the potential threat for biological warfare 
is very terrifying, okay, because of the ways, the ease with which certain diseases can be passed through contagion. Uh, chemical warfare is a silent, invisible, pervasive, and deadly. You may not be able to hide from it. You may not be able to protect yourself from it. And then I have a quote here. Uh, throughout the talk, we'll have various quotes from chemical weapons survivors. This was a description of uh, a gas attack by a World War I gas survivor. Blinded, disoriented, clutching your chest, grasping for breath, drowning from mucus fluid, pouring from the lungs, choking to death. Well, as we start our discussion of chemical warfare agents, we're going to make, uh, divide them into two categories. These two categories are harassing agents and lethal agents. Now, the harassing agents uh, are nowadays called riot control agents. And the uh, harassing or riot control agents are typically your tear gases. Um, military designation for the tear gases are CS for mace, CN for another compound. These are uh, powerful lacrimators. And another class of uh, harassing agents that we're going to call vomit gases. These are going to have much the same effect as the tear gases with the additional factor that uh, they tend to induce nausea and vomiting as well. Now these are designed to temporarily incapacitate uh, either uh, opposing forces on the battlefield or as they're used more often when there's public disturbances and riots. Okay. The other type of uh, chemical agent uh, is the lethal agent. And the lethal agents are highly toxic chemicals, and these are designed to kill and, and permanently incapacitate. And within the lethal agents, there are various classifications. There are what we call the asphyxiating or choking gases. Uh, these are gases that uh, typically heavier than air, uh, they will collect in low-lying places. They are designed to irritate uh, the linings of the lungs. Uh, oftentimes, they'll cause pulmonary edema, or they can kill by simply asphyxiating, displacing air. Uh, there are blister agents. These are chemical agents that are uh, designed to uh, cause tissue damage, tissue damage on the skin, tissue da damages in the eyes, tissue damage in the mucosal membranes, and also if inhaled within the lung. Uh, there are the blood agents. Blood agents are compounds that are designed to inhibit uh, the passage of oxygen through the body, uh, or they also inhibit uh, important cell respiration mechanisms and these are also lethal. And then finally, there are the nerve agents. The most recent addition to the lethal agents are the nerve agents. Uh, the nerve agents are agents that interfere with the body's nervous system, uh, and uh, essentially, they kill by uh, stopping respiration. Okay, let's look at uh, the chemical warfare technology timeline. Essentially, chemical weapons the development of chemical weapons parallels the development of industrial chemistry. Industrial chemistry started just about 100 years ago with the large-scale uh, preparation of chemical substances. And uh, we have essentially four generations of chemical weapons. Uh, they are listed on the screen. The first <laughs> generation of chemical weapons uh, which were developed and used uh, essentially between 1900 and 1930. These are the choking agents, the blood agents, and the blister agents. Uh, in the mid-1930s through about the 1950s, uh, there was the de development of the second generation lethal agents, and these were the uh, nerve agents, which are listed under the G designation. Uh, 1950s through 1970s, uh, we have third generation uh, uh, chemical uh, agents, and these are the improved nerve agents, uh, which are listed under the V designation. And uh, the development of binary munitions, uh, previous to about the 1977-78, uh, a chemical agent 
uh, was called a unitary chemical agent. It was the pure form of the chemical substance that was toxic. Uh, and, of course, there's problems with storage and handling those type of systems. And so uh, a lot of research has gone into what we call binary agents, where you take two relative, uh, relatively innocuous materials and combine them to form the uh, chemical agent uh, just prior to uh, the agent is dispersed. And then finally, uh, there's the fourth generation uh, agents. Uh, these uh, were uh, developed between 1970 and 1980. Uh, they're given the name uh, Novichok agents. Uh, Novichok is, is Russian for newcomer. Uh, we don't have a lot of information right now about the Novichok agents. But specifically, they were developed to uh, avoid the countermeasures uh, that had been developed for the third generation of agents. Okay? Now, I'm going to talk about each one of those generations, the chemical substances and their effects, in a little bit more detail. But there's a question. Why develop and use chemical warfare agents? Well, there's a reason for that. And let's take a look at this quote. Chemical weapons are a kind of poor man's atomic bomb. This was a statement made by uh, an Iranian uh, president in 1988, uh, roughly at the end of the Iraq-Iran War. And the reason why chemical agents have been developed is because they are lethal, extremely lethal. They have a large footprint. Uh, that means their lethality exists over a large area. And they're relatively cheap. Okay? And uh, military uh, planners have a way of measuring the relative lethality of weapons. Uh, it's called the Battlefield Lethality Index. And for uh, some reason, they've chosen the lethalness of the English longbow of the 14th and 15th century as being our reference point. And uh, we can see that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the smoothbore musket is no more lethal than the English longbow. But starting in the 19th century, there is a steady increase in the lethality of weapons. The rifle musket, repeating rifle, machine gun, tank, artillery barrage of World War I, and the gas barrage of World War I. So we can see that the first time that chemical weapons are used extensively are going to be in World War I. The gas barrage is among the most lethal of the weapons employed during that conflict. And then we see a continued increase as we proceed through the 20th century. Uh, we see the 20 kiloton tactical nuclear device. 20 kilotons is roughly the size of the nuclear weapons dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, these have a lethality index of uh, 100,000. And what we have here is a nerve agent attack. And this would be a nerve agent attack on unprotected victims. And a nerve agent attack on unprotected victims has about the same lethality as a small nuclear device. Okay? So, very lethal. In addition, uh, they're pretty inexpensive when you compare them to other weapon systems. Uh, here we have some data. This is uh, U.S. nerve agent production and costs. This is the total cost estimated between 1950 and 1969. Now, this includes research and production. It does not include the delivery systems. And it's listed in $1969. And so we can see that to create uh, one of the nerve gases uh, that were in the, was in the United States arsenal, uh, nerve agent GB, also called sarin, uh, the United States produced 22,000 tons of this nerve agent at a total cost of $350 million. Uh, a third generation nerve agent VX produced 8,000 tons of it at a total cost of $240 million. So, a little over a half a billion dollars buys a lot of killing power. And in terms of uh, military expenditures, half a billion dollars doesn't even show up. It's, it's lost there in the baseline. Okay? So there's a lot of killing power. Uh, in terms of cost of nerve agent, Okay, typically in that time, 50 to 69, uh, the cost of creating one pound of the nerve agent GB was $8 a pound. The cost of creating one pound of VX was $15 a pound. Uh, one pound of GB is roughly 1,450 lethal doses. 
One pound of VX is 35,000, approximately 35,000 lethal doses. <coughs> so again, nerve agents are relatively inexpensive. And that's why there were at least 26 countries known to have developed nerve agents or have active programs in developing nerve agents. And again, let's take a look at this statement right here. Every pharmaceutical plant, every brewery, every fertilizer plant is a potentially a chemical weapons plant, all right? Uh, it doesn't take an advanced chemical technology to begin to produce chemical weapons. And so we say that the cost of entry into the chemical weapons club is fairly low. Okay, if you look at the states uh, that have um, uh, had chemical weapons programs, we can see that they run from very rich nations like the United States uh, and European countries to some relatively poor countries. Um, we have taken the countries and broken down <coughs> known to have, likely to have, suspected to have, and have had. There are countries that have had chemical weapons programs which have ended and they have uh, disarmed and disposed of their agents. Uh, now, let me point out that in 1993, uh, most of the nations that were known to have had chemical weapons and uh, 122 other nations signed the 1993 Chemical Weapons Convention, which has banned the uh, possession and manufacture of chemical weapons. Okay? Uh, three countries that either are known to have chemical weapons or most likely have chemical weapons have not signed this ban. Uh, they are North Korea, Syria, and interestingly enough, Egypt. Okay. Um, both uh, Russia, formerly the Soviet Union, and the United States have signed this ban. These are the two countries that had 95 to 99 percent of all the chemical agents they are in the process of disposing of these chemical agents, and uh, they are required to have completely disposed of their chemical agents by April 29, 2012, so just a year from now. Okay? Um, some of the last uh, measurements uh, that I've seen as of June uh, 2010, the United States had completed 81% of its disposal. However, as of June 20th, uh, 2010, the Russia had only disposed of about 50% of their agent. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to get into the history of chemical warfare use, and uh, I have a somewhat uh, gruesome picture on the on the slide here. Uh, it's almost it's very historical in a sense. Uh, this is a uh, French soldier who was a victim of a German mustard gas attack. Now, this is an original 1917 color photograph. All right. uh, there were some processes that, that made color photographs in 1917. Uh, one of the things we can say, see on this victim is he has extensive patches of uh, brown patches and scaly blistering on his body. This was caused by the chemical agent uh, we call mustard gas. And then we have uh, a quotation here. Uh, this was from a post-mortem account taken by a British surgeon on a vic British victim of uh, uh, chemical agent uh, mustard gas. Case four, age 39 years, gas 29 July 1917. Admitted to casualty clearing station the same day, died about 10 days later. Brownish pigmentation present over a large surface of the body. A white ring of skin where the wristwatch was located. Marked superficial burning of the face and scrotum. The larynx much congested. The whole of the trachea was covered by a yellow membrane. The bronchi contained abundant gas. The lungs fairly voluminous. The right lung showing extensive collapse at the base, and so on. So you can get the uh, impression from this quote that uh, death by chemical agent, in particular mustard gas, must have been an incredibly painful experience. Okay? Well, the history of uh, chemical warfare use essentially begins with World War I, 1914 to 1918. And almost from the very beginning, chemical agents were used. 
in this war. In 1997, uh, at, at The Hague, most of the great European powers, the United States and a number of other countries, signed agreements not to use poisons in warfare. That was signed in 1897. In 1914, with the start of World War I, those agreements went out the window very quickly. Now, initially, the first uh, uses of chemical agents were the harassing agents, using tear gases in particular. Okay? And it's interesting that uh, the various uses of tear gas, uh, the French were the very first people to try using tear gas. Then the Germans followed up. Uh, the first uses of chemical agents such as tear gas were not particularly effective. In fact, there's a great story about the use of a, of a, of a lacrimating agent, uh, which is um, alpha bromoacetophenone. <coughs> Some of you know the structure of acetophenone. You don't know what this compound looks like. Uh, the Germans used it in Russia during winter, and the temperatures in Russia were below the uh, melting point of the compound. So it just froze out. However, uh, we look at this uh, table right here. I've set three red letter days because these were the days when, uh, these are the times when truly lethal chemical agents were introduced. And typically what, we, what you see in the use of chemical agents during World War I is an escalation in the deadliness of the chemical agents. Okay? And also during this time, there's the development of uh, measures and countermeasures. So a, a gas is introduced, countermeasures are, taken, uh, are, are undertaken to uh, limit the effects of this gas, then a new gas is introduced. All right? <coughs> now the very first gas that was uh, used in uh, uh, World War I that was a truly lethal agent was chlorine gas, molecular chlorine. And uh, the German used molecular chlorine in uh, April 22nd, 1915, okay? Fairly early on in World War I. Uh, the results of the use of that gas uh, were significant. Uh, there were approximately 5,000 dead and about 10,000 injured. Uh, countermeasures were developed to uh, lower the, uh, the effects of chlorine gas. And so a new gas was introduced in December of 1915. Uh, and this was sort of the standard chemical warfare agent that was used throughout the war. It's phosgene. Okay? We'll see what the structure of phosgene in a little bit. Phosgene is a much deadlier gas than molecular chlorine. However, if we look at the results, the numbers of dead and injured caused by the first phosgene release are significantly less than chlorine. And that's because in the uh, six or so months between April, chlorine, and December, when phosgene was introduced, the troops had, been, had learned how to protect themselves to some extent from chemical agents. So there is sort of a uh, leveling off in the uh, killing power of the various chemical agents. And uh, the last red letter day is July 17th, or July 12th, rather, 1917. And this was when the Germans introduced the chemical agent we're going to call mustard gas. And uh, again, mustard gas did not uh, cause a great deal of deaths. But what it did do was cause a lot of injuries. And these were uh, very terrifying injuries for the troops involved. Uh, we can look at the estimated gas casualties for all of World War I. Uh, there were a total of 88,500 deaths attributed to chemical agents. Now, there were 7 million men killed during World War I. So the number of men that were killed by chemical agents is really relatively small. Uh, if we look at the non-fatal cases, well, that's considerably more at uh, about uh, 1.2 million, but still that's relatively small compared to the total injuries. 
So even though there weren't a lot of deaths and there really weren't a lot of injuries, chemical agents had a terrifying effect on the battlefield. And men in battle are not as much afraid of being killed quickly as of, su as of suffering terrifying injuries. And one of the problems is that chemical agents can really inflict terrifying injuries. Uh, we can also take a quick look at uh, lethal war gas production. Uh, of the different types of uh, lethal war gases, uh, chlorine, phosgene, mustard gas, hydrogen cyanide, uh, and a latecomer compound called lewisite. Uh, most of the chemical agents were chlorine and phosgene. Okay, they accounted for uh, the vast bulk of all of the chemical agents. So let's look at these chemical agents in a little bit more detail. We'll start uh, with 22nd of April, 1915, at 5 a.m. Okay? The Germans introduced chemical warfare agents. They did this by uh, collecting 5,000 cylinders of chlorine gas containing 168 tons of chlorine gas, and then waiting for the wind to blow in the correct direction. Um, during World War II, the Germans were always at a disadvantage in terms of chemical warfare, primarily because in that part of Europe, northern France, Belgium, the wind, the wind typically blows from the southwest, and the Germans' lines were northeast. And so uh, oftentimes, even when they would use chemical weapons, it would sort of boomerang back at them. But they waited for um, the proper wind direction. They released uh, chlorine gas along a four-mile front. Okay. The officer in command of this chemical release was the officer in command of the fledgling uh, German chemical service. And his name was Fritz Haber. Anybody hear of Fritz Haber before? Yeah, he's a famous chemist and a Nobel Prize winner. Okay. He is considered to be the father of German chemical warfare. Uh, the gas was the first, uh, first time gas was used. It had a devastating effect. And here's a picture of uh, the use of uh, a gas. I think this is uh, chlorine gas as well. Essentially along a line of trenches just opened up the tanks and released it. Okay. 5,000 dead, 10,000 injured, all right? The reason why so many people were dead was because of panic. They'd never been exposed to chemical weapons before. They totally panicked. They hid down in the bottom of their trench. Chlorine is denser than air. Chlorine collects in the bottom of the trench. Or they left their trench and ran back to the rear lines. The chlorine was blowing that direction. So they were exposed to the chlorine gas for a very long time. Okay. Uh, after that, people learned. Chemical attack, if it was a chlorine attack, you actually climbed out of the trench. You got above the level of the trench. Okay. The air was much clearer when you got above the level of the trench. So the amount of uh, deaths and subsequent attacks were much fewer. Also, there were some simple uh, countermeasures that people learned to take. Uh, for example, chlorine is somewhat water soluble. So if you covered your uh, face with uh, cloth that had been soaked in water, uh, it gave a certain level of protection. Okay? Even better was to soak that cloth in urine, okay? because chlorine reacts with the urea in Europe. Right. Uh, it didn't take very long, but simple gas masks began to reach uh, the Allies in the front within uh, about uh, eight weeks of the Germans' use of chlorine gas. Okay. Now, essentially, chlorine gas is a powerful irritant. If you've ever got a whiff of chlorine gas, you know it. Uh, it tends to uh, cause damage to uh, the uh, eyes, the nose, the throat, the lungs. Okay? If you're uh, prolonged high concentrations of it, 
will cause death by asphyxia. Okay, it will just displace out air. Okay, even if you don't die from as direct asphyxia, oftentimes the chlorine gas, when it gets into the lungs, will react with water in the lungs that will create hydrochloric acid and hypochlorous acid. And this will begin to uh, cause damage to the cells of the lungs and you'll develop pulmonary edema, fluid secretions into the lungs. All right. And so uh, chlorine killed in several different ways. It also incapacitated. Okay. Well, six months later, an even more deadly gas was introduced. This was the compound we call phosgene. All right. This is phosgene right here. It's also called carbonyl chloride. Now, phosgene was first synthesized back in 1812 by Humphrey Davies, and he simply allowed carbon monoxide to react with chlorine in the presence of sunlight. So that's how phosgene gets its name. Phos, sun, gene means, uh, comes from the Latin word for making. It's made from the sun. Okay? Uh, other ways of making phosgene, again, are to take carbon monoxide, take molecular chlorine, and an activated uh, carbon catalyst. Pass them through it, and you'll generate and form phosgene. Okay, now, uh, the Germans first used phosgene in December of 1915, and they also began to uh, sort of modify their delivery systems. Uh, they developed artillery shells that could be filled with gas, and when they had a, uh, exploded, they had a small charge to explode them, it would release the gas over the enemy lines. So they delivered their phosgene in artillery shells. And again, the result was 69 dead and a little over 1,000 injured. Signi significantly less than chlorine because troops had already begun to learn how to protect themselves from the gases. Uh, here's an example of a German phosgene gas cylinder uh, that was unearthed near the Belgian town of Ypres in 2006. And they're constantly finding unexploded gas shells uh, in the soil of northern France and southern Belgium. Okay? Now, the uh, thing about phosgene is, unlike, uh, unlike chlorine, which is irritating, phosgene is much less irritating. Okay, so uh, there's not as much impetus to scram and get away from the gas as there is with chlorine, okay? Uh, and its symptoms are much slower to appear than with chlorine. Uh, now, phosgene can be detected at 0.4 parts per million, but phosgene doesn't necessarily have a, have a nasty aroma, so uh, you're less, like I said, you're less likely to uh, avoid it, okay? Now, uh, one of the things that phosgene does is it uh, acts on uh, some of the proteins uh, that are present in the lung uh, alveoli. And phosgene can be used as a crosslinker, crosslink proteins. In particular, uh, it's going to crosslink proteins that contain amino groups. So it, it damages these proteins. You're going to damage cell. Uh, you're going to damage the cell. Uh, once you've done that, you begin to disrupt the blood air barrier. You make it more difficult for oxygen to pass into the blood. Okay? And also, phosgene is hydrolyzed in water. So again, phosgene plus water is going to give you carbon dioxide and hydrochloric acid. And the hydrochloric acid can also cause uh, chemical burns. That brings us to uh, the third and final uh, chemical agent of World War I. And interestingly enough, this chemical agent killed far fewer than uh, either phosgene or chlorine. Uh, it injured large numbers of people, and it injured them in a way that uh, made it kind of the terror weapon of its day. And this is the compound we call mustard gas. Now, mustard gas goes by the chemical name of bis-2-chloroethyl sulfide. There's our sulfide, there's our chloroethyl chloroethyl. 
two of them. Uh, mustard gas could be synthesized several different ways. Uh, both methods were developed. Uh, the Meyer synthesis was used by the Germans. The Debrett synthesis was used by the Allies during World War I. In the Meyer synthesis, we're simply taking two chloroethanol, uh, two equivalents. We're reacting it with potassium sulfide. That gives us the diol, the, the, the bis uh, hydroxyethyl sulfide. And then we react it with thionyl chloride. This will be a good reaction for folks in organic chemistry. Okay, what we have here is a primary alcohol. We have thionyl chloride. What do we form? We form an alkyl chloride. Okay, so uh, some nice chemistry there. Uh, the Depret synthesis, uh, we take uh, that chlorosulfide, we treat it with two equivalents of ethylene, and we make the mustard agent. Okay, now uh, one of the things about mustard gas. It's called a blister agent because where the mustard gas touches on the skin, large blisters form. Okay, uh, and again, the thing about mustard gas is that the effects don't occur right away. In fact, there's a lag time between 12 and 24 hours. The first time mustard gas was used, the immediate effects amongst the troops exposed to it was sneezing. They just sneezed. Then the sneezing stopped, they didn't think anything about it. And then 12 to 24 hours, they started developing large, painful blisters where the mustard gas had caused chemical burns on their skin. Okay. Uh, mustard gas also would cause blindness. And again, it wouldn't happen right away. The effects would come uh, considerably later after the first exposure. And so uh, once the uh, mustard gas uh, action began to take place, uh, then there were some significant uh, tissue damage to the victims. Um, if uh, mustard gas was in the eyes, uh, blindness could result. If it was brought into the lungs, then scarring of the tissues of the lungs uh, would result. If the concentrations were high enough, uh, victims would die. It could kill the victim. And even if the concentrations weren't high enough, uh, many of the victims would die from secondary infections caused by the tissue, uh, the chemical burns on their tissues. All right? And let's look at another quote. This is a British nurse describing mustard gas victims uh, back in a hospital. Great mustard colored blisters. Blind eyes all sticky and stuck together, always fighting for breath. They cannot be bandaged or touched. Gas burns must be agonizing because usually the other cases, uh, the ones who receive simple bullet wounds or shrapnel wounds, do not complain, even with the worst wounds. But gas cases are invariably beyond endurance, and they cannot help but cry out. Okay? And it was this... Um, aspect of mustard gas that turned it into a terror weapon. Again, the troops were afraid, afraid of the effects of this gas. Again, here's another iconic picture from World War I. This was a British soldier uh, recovering from mustard gas uh, exposure. We can see blisters along his face. We can see blisters on his neck and on his hands where he was exposed to the chemical agent. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the effects of mustard gas in terms of uh, their health effects. Again, uh, mustard gas, number one, is a fat-soluble substance, which means it can penetrate the skin and get into the cells fairly easily. Uh, <clears throat> tissue damage is sim similar to thermal burns, except that they take much longer to heal. Okay. Acute mortality is low. Uh, however, death may occur within 24 hours from toxic shock. All right? Uh, or days to weeks later from secondary infection. So once the blisters became infected with bacteria, at that time there were no effective antibiotics. Uh, and then uh, the, the victim could die from bacterial infection. 
Okay, inhaled mustard gas uh, causes bleeding and blistering of the respiratory system. Uh, toxicity of the mustard agent, uh, when we're looking at toxicity, uh, we can talk about uh, LCT50. Uh, this is the lethal concentration that would uh, kill 50% of its uh, victims. Uh, this is corrected for time. So this is milligrams of uh, mustard agent over a given period of time per meter of uh, air. And under inhalation, about 1,500 uh, milligram minutes uh, per cubic meter. Uh, that's not a very high concentration. Uh, skin exposure, uh, somewhat higher concentration, but again, that's not a very large concentration. And the smallest blister causing dose on the skin is two hundredths of a milligram. All right, two hundredths of a milligram on the skin will cause a chemical burn and blister. Uh, how does uh, mustard gas uh, do what it does? What, it's, what is its mechanism of toxicity? Well, again, this is a nice little uh, discussion for an organic chemistry class. Uh, here's mustard gas here. And what we find is that the sulfur, which is a very good nucleophile, undergoes an intramolecular SN2 reaction where we displace a, a chlorine as a chloride anion. And that gives us this cyclic sulfonium cation. Now that cyclic sulfonium cation is an awesome electrophile, okay? And we are going to end up alkylating uh, both DNA and proteins, okay? Uh, in particular, you'll alkylate the uh, guanine nucleotide in DNA. And once you've done that, you begin to alter the DNA. Uh, you can actually cross-link the DNA strands because you've got two ends that can alkylate, okay? Uh, so you're going to begin to cause cell damage and cell death because of its effects on DNA. Likewise, you can begin to react with proteins, okay? In particular, proteins that contain uh, sulfur, like uh, cysteine, okay, cysteine resin. And so again, you can alkylate uh, single cysteine residue, or you can cross-link two cysteine residues in a proton, and again, in a protein rather. And again, once you do that, you're causing uh, damage to the cellular machinery, and cell death can ensue. Okay, so that's the primary mechanism of toxicity of mustard gas. Uh, Long-term effects. After World War I, uh, physicians began to recognize that mustard gas exposure resulted in some long-term effects. Uh, but first off, I just want to point out that um, mustard gas was produced in relatively small quantities uh, compared to chlorine and phosgene, but it actually resulted in more injuries than phosgene. Uh, and uh, chlorine. And uh, the depth, uh, the, the, the lethality of mustard gas exposure itself is relatively low. Uh, only about 2% of all mustard gas casualties died. But the incapacitating effects of mustard gas is significantly high. For example, 60% of all American mustard gas casualties, America got into the war in late 1917, by early 1918, they were involved in battles. 60% of uh, the American mustard gas casualties had to be repatriated back to hospitals in the United States. All right? And one third of these uh, casualties were still hospitalized 18 months after the end of the war. Okay? It took a long time to recover from these mustard gas wounds. Uh, World War I survivors of mustard gas exposure exhibited increased death rates from Cancers of all types, but primarily lung cancer. Uh, this is where things get a little personal for me. Uh, my grandfather on my father's side was a mustard gas uh, casualty during World War I. And he died at the age of 49 from lung cancer, never had smoked in his life. So I, I believe that the mustard gas contributed to his early passing. Uh, various pulmonary diseases. 
again from the inhalation of mustard gas, and tuberculosis. Uh, a lot of the lung scarring that the survivors had uh, predisposed them to picking up tuberculosis, which was somewhat rampant and very contagious at the time. And a 1955 study concluded that exposure to mustard gas cut seven years off the life expectancy of the World War I male co cohort. Those who had uh, uh, been exposed to mustard gas in World War II had a life expectancy of 50, 50 uh, World War I rather, had a life expectancy of 56 years as opposed to 63 years. Right. So that's uh, World War I. Um, as I mentioned before, the United States was late in entering World War I, and it was also sort of a Johnny-come-lately in terms of its uh, develop, use and development of chemical warfare agents, but there was one particular uh, chemical agent that was developed by the United States. Uh, it was a little too late to see uh, use in World War I, but it was produced and stockpiled by both the United States and Japan in the years after the World War. This is a compound called lewisite, and it's codenamed Agent L. This is lewisite right here, and what it is, it's 2-chloroethyl arsenous dichloride. And this is the way that uh, lewisite was prepared. Uh, take uh, tri uh, arsenic trichloride, you take acetylene, and you've got it right there. Very easy drug to make. Okay. Um, this was first synthesized. Interesting story about uh, this compound, the compound we call lewisite. It was first synthesized in 1904 by a Catholic priest, uh, Reverend J.A. Newland, and he was uh, a student at the Catholic University in Washington, D.C., and this was part of his Ph.D. thesis. In the course of synthesizing this compound in 19, uh, 1904, he was exposed to it, and he was hospitalized for several days due to the toxic effect of this compound. And here we have an actual quote from his lab notebook. The lab took on a nauseating odor and caused marked irritation effect on the mucous surfaces. The headache resulting persists several hours and the material seems to be quite toxic. Lab notebook of Reverend Newland. Okay. Interesting story about uh, Reverend Newland is that he then on, went on to become an organic professor at uh, University of Notre Dame, and he was Newt Rockne's uh, chemistry instructor, and uh, he was trying to convince Newt Rockne into going on to graduate school in organic chemistry, but if you know anything about football, he decided to coach the University of Notre Dame. I don't know why. Now, uh, the compound is not called Newlandite, it's called Lewisite, because it was weaponized by Colonel Win Winfred Lewis, who was an associate professor at Northwestern University in Chicago, and he was the first director of the offensive branch of the Chemical Warfare Service of the United States Army in 1918. Uh, apparently, he was called on the telephone by uh, the Reverend J.A. Newland, who informed him about uh, the action of this compound that he had synthesized, and they began further uh, research efforts on, on it. Now, lewisite is a blister agent. It acts much like mustard gas, but one of the uh, things we find with lewisite is that unlike mustard gas, exposure to lewisite brings on pain and blistering almost immediately. Okay? So skin contact causes immediate pain, inhalation causes burning pain, coughing, vomiting, and pulmonary, pulmonary edema. Eye contact causes blistering and corneal scarring. Systemic exposure can lead to liver necrosis and death. Its advantages <coughs> over mustard gas was that it's fast acting. It would have an immediate effect on the battlefield. Uh, and it easily penetrates clothing and rubber. Okay. So uh, rubber protection in the form of clothing or gas masks uh, uh, do not work with lewisite. Now its disadvantage is that it's hydrolyzed very quickly compared to mustard gas. And it's totally ineffective in wet, humid conditions. Well, hydrolysis. Let's look at our compound here. What's being hydro hydrolyzed? Well, we're hydrolyzing the chlorines off the arsenic. Okay? 
and the resulting product of hydrolysis is non-toxic. So that was its disadvantage. The United States produced about 30,000 tons of lewisite uh, up through 1930. Uh, at the end of World War II, the United States was producing about 150 tons of lewisite a week, but it was never used in warfare by the United States. World War I ended before its use. Uh, other lethal agents. We'll just take a quick look at some of the other lethal agents that were used uh, during this time. Well, there were the blood agents. Uh, hydrogen cyanide. Well, we all know that that's pretty nasty stuff. Uh, and then related to the <coughs> hydrogen cyanide are uh, the uh, cyano uh, uh, cy cyanogen chloride, cyanogen bromide. Okay. Uh, all of these are cyanide agents. Uh, cyanide agent uh, will inhibit iron-containing enzymes. Uh, it will uh, affect hemoglobin. And in particular, it affects uh, cytochrome oxidase, uh, complex 4. And uh, it will stop respiration. It inhibits respiration, cell respiration. Uh, we also have choking agents. Remember, both chlorine and phosgene were uh, choking agents. Other choking agents that were developed were diphosgene, uh, otherwise known as trichloromethyl uh, chloroformate. Uh, you'll notice that some of these compounds have names, Agent DP, Agent PS, and so on. These are the U.S. military's designation for these chemical agents. Uh, another choking agent is chloropicrin, okay, otherwise known as trichloronitromethane. All right? Again, the choking agents uh, work by either displacing air from low-lying areas, or uh, getting inhaled into the lungs uh, and uh, causing pulmonary edema within the lungs. Interestingly, these two compounds here had been developed between the periods of 1900 and 1915 as pesticides, rodenticides, and fumigants. So it's their use as chemical warfare agents is a natural out outgrowth of this, uh, of this use, original use. Uh, additional blister agents. Uh, some of these uh, arsenical compounds, again, were developed as pesticides prior to the use of World War, uh, prior to World War I, and uh, Agent PD is uh, phenyl arsine dichloride, methyl arsine dichloride, ethyl arsine dichloride. Okay, these were all blister agents. Uh, let's look at some non-lethal chemical agents. Again, I said these were used at the beginning of the war. And they were used a few times also during the war. I just want to talk about three of these. Uh, the first one is this compound right here, alpha chloroacetophenone. Okay? This is the active ingredient of mace, mace spray, the chemical spray. Uh, it's also called Agent CN. This compound right here, <coughs> this compound is called orthochloro uh, benzylidine melanonitrile. This is called Agent CS, and this is what's uh, used right now as uh, the primary, whoops, prime, primary riot control agent. Oops, oops, sorry, that was my time. Okay, uh, I'm going to jump ahead here. What, one thing I want to talk on very quickly, how about the aftermath of chemical warfare in World War II? Uh, October 18, 1918, an Austrian corporal serving in the German army is injured by mustard gas, fired by the British, and he was evacuated back to Germany a few days later, blinded and blistered. That's this guy right here. Anybody know who that is? That's Adolf Hitler. Uh, here's a quote from uh, Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf. About 7 o'clock, my eyes were scorching. A few hours later, my eyes were like glowing coals, and all was darkness above me. I want you to keep in mind that Hitler was a chemical agent survivor. That's going to have an, uh, an impact coming on uh, a little bit later. 
Uh, the other person I want to take a look at is this person right here. That is Fritz Haber, Nobel Prize winner, also the father of German chemical warfare. Uh, at the end of the world, World War I, when Germany was defeated, he thought that he was going to be tried as a war criminal, so he fled in disguise to Switzerland and stayed there about six months. Well, he wasn't tried as a war criminal, and in fact, in 1919, he received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his development of the uh, Haber process. That's a means for fixing, uh, fixing atmospheric nitrogen, generating ammonia from nitrogen. Now, during his speech, in which he received the Nobel Prize, he made this statement here. He was, he was not exactly apologetic about his development of chemical warfare agents. In fact, he was proud of it. And he said, in no future war will the military be able to ignore poison gas. It is a higher form of killing. Okay? Now, the use of chemical agents in World War I truly horrified the belligerents. It was, it was something they hadn't seen before. Bullets, shells, machine guns, even aerial bombardment was one thing. Chemical agents were another. So the great powers gathered together in 1925 and developed the protocol for the prohibition of the use of asphyxiating poisonous or other gases and the bacterial methods of warfare. Okay? This was called the Geneva Protocol of 1925. All of the great powers signed it except for the United States and Japan. Okay? Uh, chemical warfare between 1934 and 1940. Chemical warfare agents were used on two occasions between the world wars. On both occasions, they were used by belligerents against uh, nations and people who had no way of retaliating in kind. Okay? The first was the use uh, of uh, mustard gas and uh, phosgene by the Italians against the Ethiopians uh, in their war that raged between 1934 and 1936. 150,000 chemical casualties were reported during this uh, war, uh, mostly from mustard gas. And uh, if you know who Haile Selassie was, Haile Selassie was the emperor of Ethiopia at the time. He went to the League of Nat Nations and appealed for help from the League of Nations. And uh, as part of his speech, uh, he says special sprayers were installed on aircraft so that they could vaporize over vast areas of territory of fine death dealing rain. Groups of 9, 15, and 18 aircraft followed one another so that the poisons issuing from them formed a continuous fog. Uh, the League of Nations did nothing in support of Ethiopia at the time. Um, the Japanese also uh, were latecomers to the uh, game of chemical warfare. But uh, they certainly uh, didn't waste a lot of time in building up their own chemical warfare capabilities. And they used chemical agents in their war with China uh, beginning in 1937. And they used both mustard gas and lewisite. So they're the only known users of the chemical agent lewisite. The United States has never used it. Uh, estimated 100,000 Chinese gas, gas casualties. And here's a picture of some... Uh, Imperial Japanese Army troops from that time period wearing mm -hmm. gas masks in the Battle of, uh, Battle of Shanghai. Okay, I wanted to get to this. Uh, I'm going to run a little bit late here. The most deadly form of chemical warfare agent are the nerve agents. Nerve agents were actually discovered accidentally as a German chemist was looking for a more effective insecticide. This occurred in 1936. We have the birth of the deadly nerve agents. And it was discovered by accident by a Gerhard Schrader. And he was a chemist at IG Farben Industry, which was a gigantic German industrial conglomerate. But they were doing a major amount of research in chemistry, in particular looking for insecticides. And uh, during the course of developing these insecticides, they synthesized the compound, 
and there was an accidental spill of one small drop of this compound on the lab bench. And this sickened Schrader and his assistant, and they were hospitalized for three weeks. And the compound that they were synthesizing was this organophosphate compound right here. And this is called ethyl NN dimethyl phosphoramido cyanidate. Okay? And this compound was given the name Tabun. Okay? Uh, that was uh, going to be its trade name uh, because they were going to initially manufacture and use it as an insecticide. Uh, and that continued to be the name of this compound once it was uh, militarized and weaponized. And this is called Agent GA. Uh, when we talk about the G series of agents, the G stands for Germany because they were all developed by Germany. Okay, now this compound is a nerve agent. Uh, victims exposed to it will uh, exhibit a series of symptoms that comes about because of its effect uh, on the nervous system. And so some of the effects of exposure are nervousness, meiosis, which is contracted fruit pupils, rhinorrhea, which is runny nose, excessive salivation, difficulty swallowing, difficulty breathing, excessive sweating, slow heartbeat, convulsions, loss of bladder bowel control, apnea, which means stop breathing, uh, loss of consciousness, and death. Okay? We'll talk in just a, just a little bit about how these effects come about. Um, Tablet is synthesized really in just a few steps. It's fairly easy to produce, but it was difficult to stockpile because Tablet is corrosive. Uh, and the Germans, as they were trying to stockpile this material, found that uh, there was a lot of leakage. And the leakage led, led to a, a, a number of deaths before they found out the best way to store it. Uh, this was developed as a war gas by the Germans in World War II. Uh, they began construction of a production plant in 39. It was completed in 42. Uh, it had a production capacity of 1,000 tons a month. And by the end of World War II, 12,500 tons were produced. Uh, at the end of the war, uh, the Soviet Union captured the plant and all of the tabun and sent it back to German, the Soviet Union. And that became the standard uh, nerve agent in the Soviet Union. Okay, there's a couple of other nerve agents. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about them. These were developed later and were even more effective than tabun. Okay. Uh, the Allies themselves did some research on nerve agents. In particular, uh, Schrader published a paper on the synthesis of this compound right here, dimethylphosphoramidofluoride, or fluoridic acid rather, and uh, he discussed its potential uh, use as a new and powerful insecticide. In fact, he actually applied for patents simultaneously in Germany, the UK, the US, and Switzerland. Well, that broadcast uh, information and it was picked up by British chemists in the Chemical Weapons Service. And so uh, using this as a guide, they began to try to develop their own organophosphate uh, agents. And one particular compound that was developed by the Allies, although never used, was this substance right here. We're going to call it DFP for diisopropyl phosphor phosphorofluoride. Okay. Now, the relative lethality of the nerve agents, uh, we can see in terms of the relative lethality, we're looking at toxicity by injection, injecting a dose into mice based upon the weight of the mice. Uh, we can see that DFP is significantly less effective than any of the G-series nerve agents. But still, it was developed by the Allies. Uh, another table of relative lethalities, uh, both the nerve agents and other toxic gases. If you have a uh, handout, you can take a look at them. Now, by World War II, the all, everybody knew how to produce blister agents, mustard gas, lewisite. But the Germans had 
and edge because they had, the, they had the nerve agents. And yet, despite the fact that they had the nerve agents, which really gave them an advantage, uh, none of the belligerents in World War II, other than the Japanese, used chemical agents. And there's always been a question, why? Why were chemical agents not used in World War II? All sorts of other new killing instruments were developed in World War II. Why didn't we use the nerve agents? Well, there's a, a number of uh, reasons. Uh, first off, military commanders in World War II had probably been line officers during World War I. They had been exposed to chemical agents, and they had developed sort of a horror of chemical warfare. Uh, and again, remember, even Hitler himself had been gassed in World War II. So some believe that the reason why the Germans didn't use their chemical weapons advantage was because Hitler never gave them the order to do so because he remembered being gassed himself during World War II. Uh, other reasons why chemical agents weren't used in World War II. World War II, unlike World War I, which was static fighting from trenches, World War II was a mobile mechanized form of warfare. And chemical agents really don't lend themselves very well to the tactics of fast moving mechanized warfare. And the corollary to this is that the defensive side, which is the side which is more likely to be in static defensive positions, is the one is the side that is more susceptible to the use of chemical warfare agents. And so the question is, why invite retaliation if you're a defense on the defensive by using chemical agents if you're going to be more susceptible to them? And then we have the third reason. This is what most historians historians believe that the Germans didn't use chemical agents. If we have them, the other side must have them. All right? Uh, the Germans were convinced that the Allies also had access to nerve agents. But did they? Well, DFP is really a weak nerve agent. So they really didn't have nerve agents as we understand them today. Okay, so I'm going to try to move into something very quickly. Uh, I'm not going to go into uh, the ultimate nerve agent, compound we call VX. I want to get into the mechanism of nerve agent, nerve agent action. Okay, nerve agents inhibit an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. Now, acetylcholinesterase is present in nervous uh, system cells, present in muscle tissues and red blood cells. Now, what this enzyme does is it catalyzes the hydrolysis of acetylcholine to choline and acetic acid. That's an incredibly important uh, process, and I'll explain why. It's also the fastest hydrolytic enzyme known. It has a turnover rate of 2 times 10 to the 7. Very fast activity. This is acetylcholine right here. This is a neurotransmitter. It transmits nerve signals from one axis to another. It is broken down by a process of hydrolysis. When hydrolyzed, this is an ester. Again, we're in chemistry. What do you get when you hydrolyze an ester? We get an acid and an alcohol. We get acetic acid and we get choline. Now, acetylcholine is uh, synthesized in sites of a cell, of an axon, and it is stored. And when a nerve signal propagates through that cell, it reaches the sites where the stored acetylcholine is uh, stored, and it releases the acetylcholine into the synaptic gap between itself and another nerve cell. Now, within uh, the other nerve cell are receptors, acetylcholine uh, receptors, which the acetylcholine binds to. And when it binds to these receptors, that stimulates uh, nerve activity in the receptor cell. Now, here's a picture of the uh, receptors in the cell. Here's our synaptic cleft. Synap synaptic cleft. This is the space between the two nerve cells. Acetylcholine are these little molecules right here. 
Acetylcholine binds to receptors in, uh, of two different types. There's what we call a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. This is responsible for um, uh, soft muscle activity, for uh, hormonal secretions, uh, the parasympathetic nerve activity. And then there is another receptor called the nicotinic acetyl receptor. This is responsible for smooth muscle activity. Okay? Acetylcholine binds to and activates both of these receptors. When it activates the nicotinic receptor, the nicotinic receptor opens up and we begin to depolarize the neuron and the cell signal propagates. Uh, also, within the membrane, the cell membrane, are acetylcholine esterase. The purpose of acetylcholine esterase is to take the acetylcholine, which is released, and break it down into acetic acid and choline. And the reason we want to do that is that if the concentration of acetylcholine builds up too high, you get a mass action effect. And what happens is you begin to saturate the acetylcholine receptor sites. And when you saturate the acetylcholine receptor sites, it's like jamming uh, the uh, cell control all the way on on. That cell continues to fire, muscles continue to contract. And so acetylcholine is important in breaking down, uh, acetylcholine uh, esterase is important in breaking down that acetylcholine so that we don't saturate the receptor sites, okay? And what happens is that the nerve agents block the acetylcholine uh, esterase. And so the acetylcholine is not being uh, broken down, okay? So here's a quick model of something that, that, that uh, shows what's going on here. Here is acetylcholine. This is our sort of cartoon model of acetylcholine esterase. It contains what we call an esteratic site. It contains an anionic site within the structure of the enzyme. And here is acetylcholine. And we can see that acetylcholine contains a quaternary ammonium ion, positive charge, that is attracted to the anionic site. The esteratic site has a serine residue with an OH group. In the acetylcholine, we have an ester functional group. And so what happens is that the serine residue, which has a, hydrox a hydroxyl group on it, begins to interact with the carboxyl group, carboxylate group of the acetylcholine, and we begin to uh, add the oxygen to the uh, carboxylate car uh, carbon. Okay. As we do, we begin to lose uh, the choline here as an alkyl. So it's a simple hydrolysis of an ester. And choline goes away. We initially have uh, the serine has been acylated. Okay, so the serine residue has been acylated. And then under the action of the enzyme, water comes in. And we again hydrolyze an ester functional group and we lose acetic acid, and we regenerate our serine residue. So that's the action of acetylcholine esterase. Well, let me shut this thing off. Again, there is our acetylcholine. This is our ester. Uh, this, this, is, this is our... Uh, This is our acetylcholine esterase. There are certain residues within the ester that are going to be responsible for converting the acetylcholine. We bind to the serine residue. Okay, as we bind to the serine residue, we are going to displace out the alcohol as our leaving group. Okay, that's the choline. The choline leaves the binding site of the ester. And then water interacts with a nearby histidine residue. And 
we then hydrolyze off the, acet uh, the acetyl group and we get acetic. So that is the action. What do the nerve agents do? The nerve agents permanently bind to the serine residue. Okay? Once you permanently bond to the serine residue, you've blocked it and you have no more activity with that. Uh, enzyme. Well, got a little bit over here, so I'm going to kind of quickly wrap up. Sorry about this. Had a lot more to tell you, but we just don't have time. I want to finish up by uh, just reading a poem. This poem was written by a British uh, soldier in World War I. His name was Wilfred Owen. Uh, he was KIA uh, on the Western Front in World War I. In the background is an Iranian soldier, uh, 1988, during the Iran-Iraq War. Uh, Iraq used chemical agents. And let's read this poem entitled Gas Attack, Gas, Gas, Quick Boys, An Ecstasy of, of Fumbling, Fitting the Clumsy Helmets Just in Time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes of the thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. Yeah, I think that illustrates the poignancy of being under a chemical weapons attack. And with that, I want to say thank you very much. I know I've gone a little bit over time. I have so much more to tell you about, but we just don't have time. And if anybody has any questions, be glad to answer the questions. Any questions? What do you think the scariest gas is? Like, what's the worst thing? Well, the scariest gas right now are the nerve agents. Uh, in particular, I mentioned this, the, the, the Russian developments in the 1980s, uh, the Novichok nerve agents. Uh, supposedly, they were developed to be impervious to all the known antidotes. I didn't get a chance to talk about them, but for the normal nerve agents, the G-series and the V-series, we have antidotes. And the antidotes are actually quite effective. But the Russians developed those gases uh, to be impervious, impervious to the antidotes, to be undetectable by the type of uh, uh, instruments that we have that detect nerve agents right now. And here's the scary thing. Um, the Russians produced supposedly a couple hundred tons of uh, these Novichok agents before the Soviet Union broke up. Uh, we don't know where half of it is. All right, so there's, there's you know, 50 tons of these really, really deadly, undetectable nerve agents floating around out there. So that's scary. Another question? What is Agent or Orange considered? Okay, Agent Orange is a, a chemical agent, all right, and it is considered in chemical warfare. Uh, it is a defoliant. Uh, it was used as a defoliant. Uh, it was assumed that it didn't have effect on people. It was just used to uh, uh, destroy foliage in jungle canopy, take away jungle <coughs> canopy. Uh, it was also used to uh, uh, defoliate rice paddies. The idea was that if you took away the livelihood of Vietnamese peasants, then they would have to go into the city where they'd be more easily controlled. We now know that it definitely has a direct effect on health. In particular, it's a mutagen, an incredibly powerful mutagen. And I've seen pictures of Vietnamese babies. Uh, they have the highest rate of deformity in the world in Vietnam. And that's caused by the uh, dioxin in Agent R. How effective are uh, gas masks against now gassing? Okay. Um, against nerve agents, gas mask alone is not effective at all. All right? Uh, military has a mop suit, mission-oriented protective suit. And if you've seen pictures of them, it's essentially a rubber suit that covers the entire body. Then you have a gas mask as well. Um, some of the aspects of gas masks, 
is that uh, I, I mentioned an agent called a vomit agent. And the vomit agents can penetrate the filtering systems of uh, many gas masks, okay? So you mix a little vomit agent in with your other chemical weapon agent, and uh, you get exposed to the vomit agent, what, you, what, what are you gonna do? You're, you're starting to get nauseous, you're gonna throw up. You're not likely to throw up in your mask, so you take off the mask and then you're exposed. So, uh, against nerve agents, it's not particularly effective alone, but with the full suit, then it becomes much more effective. Anybody ever hear of uh, the Tokyo subway inc incident? Okay, there was a uh, cult in Japan called uh, Ayun Shinriko, and for some reason, uh, they felt it was their duty to bring down the Japanese government, and they had a chemist <coughs> on their staff, and he synthesized 200, gra 200 grams of sarin nerve gas, which they uh, uh, exposed people to in the Tokyo subway system. If you know anything about the Tokyo subway system, you know they pack them in like sardines. And there were six people killed by sarin gas. And they also synthesized VX. And they used VX in three targeted assassinations. They exposed three people. One of them was a Japanese journalist who was exposing the cult. <laughs> and they exposed him to VX gas, and they killed him with VX. So, those are the only known uh, uh, cases of terrorists using nerve agents. Other questions? Maybe uh, Dr. Wickham will invite me back the next time, and I can give you the other half of the talk. <laughs> Well, if we're done with questions, why don't we give Dr. Kelly a hand? Thanks for the talk.